Good morning. Welcome to First Fair Hope. If you are a guest, if this is the first time that you have watched us, um, we would love to get in contact with you. So if you will text the number on the screen and you're going to text the word welcome, our pastor would love to talk to you and introduce himself and find out a little bit about you. We are super excited to be worshiping here together this morning. Regardless of whether or not we're in a sanctuary, we are still able to worship the Lord our God. I hope you all have been going out to your mailboxes at either 7.14 a.m. or 7.14 p.m. We are going out and praying for our nation, praying for our leaders and healthcare workers, um, praying that they are able to seek the Lord's wisdom and make the decisions, the difficult decisions that need to be made during this time. So if you haven't already been doing that, I encourage you to do so now. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have allowed us to come together regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's going on in the world, we are still able to meet as a church, as the body of Christ. Father, during this time, I pray that even though we're scattered about, that we are able to be your light to those around us. Right now is a time of a lot of unsettling and confusion. But Lord, we as your body have peace because of you. So I pray that we're able to share that peace with all of those around us to be your light during this time. We love you, Lord, and it's in your precious son's name we pray, amen. Amen and welcome again. This place as we sing the gospel, we'll stand to our feet. We'll just sing to our Savior. We behold the Lamb, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave. So sing this. See Him there, the great I Am, a crown of thorns upon His head. The Father's heart displayed for us, ooh, God. We thank you for the cross. Lifted on Calvary's hill, we curse your name, and that even still you bore our shame and paid the cost. Let's behold the King of Kings. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. In Jesus you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise in this high. The sacrifice for every sin, our Savior died, the Lord of life can be contained. Oh, God has risen from the Our God has risen from the
will bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will sing. So let's just behold our Savior, Jesus. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written. song to sing, what truth to sing to our God who loves us and who comes after us. And he's coming after us. He's coming after you this morning where you are. And welcome as we continue just to worship our Savior. One of my favorite stories in 2 Kings chapter 6, story of Elijah. And he shows his servant such a wonderful, wonderful example of who really is in charge. And the story goes as they're kind of camped out in the middle and they're surrounded by the enemy. And Elijah walks out, and he's not fearful. But the servant who walks out, very, very fearful, and scared to actually ask Elijah, what are we going to do? And he says, don't worry, there are more with us than there are of them. And still frustrated, he's, he, he doesn't get it. And so he asked, Lord, please open the eyes of my servant so that he may see. When his eyes were open, angel armies just circling, just surrounding, taking care of them. And around this planet, around this earth, angel armies are, are protecting. They're encircling, waiting, waiting on the Father to release them, waiting to hear His voice. And may we be waiting to hear His voice. And He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me this morning. So whom shall we fear? There's God is for us, and who is against us? So let's sing this song we know, Whom Shall I Fear? He hears us when we call. feels the night it cannot hide the lie whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still and whom shall I fear I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name. Strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? And whom shall I fear? I
is always by my side. The one who come on, baby. he's a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. always by my side. Amen. Amen. So we glorify you, God, our Savior. We glorify you. We glorify your name. And we glorify your name. And we glorify glorify you, Jesus. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. We glorify your name in all the earth. The highest praise, it belongs to you, God. The highest praise is yours. The highest praise is yours. The highest praise is yours in all the earth. Come on, let's sing that again. The highest praise is yours, Jesus. The you up and we celebrate you and we sing to you we fix our eyes on you the giver of life the giver of salvation the giver of love and so God I just pray where we are father that you would just turn our hearts you would open our minds father to receive your word God receive your truth the only truth we may not only hear from you, but that we would respond to what you're calling us to do. May we humble our hearts. May we have an obedient heart to hear you and respond to you. So God, thank you what you're going to do. Thank you what you're doing to families. And God, may you be glorified. All the praise belongs to you, Jesus, in your name. In staff meeting, Ryan Smith was 
talking about the COVID virus and he was asking if there were things that we could be thankful for or we could praise God for. And it was ironic because just the night before, Tony and I were praying before we fell asleep and I realized that it was the first time that I could really thank God of a, on a, for a journey that I'd walked through. You see, when I was 33, I was sitting in a hospital room with my husband at the time and he was being told by the doctor that he had colon cancer. And I was introduced to someone for the first time that I would take around with me. And it, that someone was fear. And it was heavy and it was real. So we're facing colon cancer with four young children. But we decided we were just going to do what we had to do to get through it and trust that the God was in control. And so we went through the year of chemo and radiation. And when I was 35, I found myself in an oncologist's office sitting beside Wes again when that doctor told him that he had six months to two years to live. And the fear was overwhelming. I was petrified. It was something that when um, I fell asleep, it was the last thing I felt before I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, as soon as I became conscious, I recognized that I was afraid. It was a, a, not a welcome visitor at all. And so I decided then that I didn't like living in the prison that I had put myself in of fear. And I started searching my Bible for Bible verses um, that dealt with fear and that dealt with peace. And, and healing. And I wrote them on three by five cards and I carried them around with me everywhere. I vividly remember sitting at the drive through at McDonald's in Eufaula, Alabama. And as I'm waiting for the Happy Meals to be handed out the window to me, I have that card and I'm flipping through these verses. Well, whenever the code, um, the, this virus came around, I kind of pushed back. Um, I didn't take it seriously. I um, really didn't get afraid until I was in Walmart and I got a text message from two different friend groups saying that they were going to close Walmart and all the grocery stores and the gas stations. And then later on that week, I had someone um, speculate they were going to shut down the interstates. Now, none of that happened, but we did start hearing shelter in place and um, all kinds of people saying, don't go out and wear masks. And, and the fear was real. And I kind of pushed back from that because of the lessons I learned earlier. Because you see, when I was 37 years old, I found myself once again in a hospital ICU room and was waiting with friends and family for my husband to take his last breath. And while it was a beautiful time and it was a, an emotionally sad time, I honestly can tell you I wasn't afraid because God had brought me through so much and taught me that He is trustworthy and He can be nothing more than trustworthy and that He is faithful. And I can lean into Him in these hard times. And so whenever I felt this virus fear coming around, it almost made me angry because I did not want that to be um, the way I handle this. I really believe that God is doing something and we've heard it. All of our pastors have said it. People that you, friends that you know have said it, God is doing something to get our attention. From the beginning of this, my heart has been burdened that we are supposed to make a kingdom difference. And the way we're gonna do this, believers, is we're gonna have to approach it different than the rest of the world. We can't cave to fear. So how can we not cave to fear? How can what the way we live be inviting and contagious? And the way we do it is to recognize, number one, that when we walk through the fire, God goes with us. And and number two, that even though we can't predict what tomorrow's gonna hold, we never could. We don't have any control over what tomorrow brings, but we can choose to, to have faith. And, and Paul told us in um, Hebrews 11.1, 1, he said, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and it is the assurance of what we cannot see. So what I'm gonna do and what I'm hoping all of us as believers are gonna do so that we can live a life that is inviting to the rest of the world is I'm gonna trust in the one who is trustworthy.
In the testimony that you just heard from Lorreen, she shared the story of how she moved from fear to faith. She shared with us that an unwelcome guest had entered into her life during a time of crisis. Fear was an ever-present reality, and she came to recognize that a choice needed to be made. And the choice that she made was a critical transition point. And in it is a lesson for us that jumps off the pages of scriptures as we look once again together at the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 24, because what we're going to see in this chapter is the same transition, the same journey that transformed and filled Lorene's life with wisdom. What was it that brought her from fear to faith? What was the critical feature of that journey? If you remember, as Lorreen shared, she was in a place of fear, and then she made a decision. It was a decision to go to the Word of God. And that's what I want to communicate to you through God's Word this morning. During this strange season, strange season in the life of our church and nation and world, you're going to have an opportunity to make some adjustments. And one of those adjustments that's going to be critical in your spiritual life is a fresh commitment to filling your life with God's Word. And so we're going to look at some resurrection encounters. And what you're going to see, especially in Luke's gospel, is that when we first are introduced to these disciples in this chapter, we find them afraid, perplexed, confused, and then something happens, and then they are filled with joy and excitement and peace. And every single time in these three encounters that we're going to look at together this morning, the critical feature is the Word of God. Look very quickly at Luke chapter 24, verse 8. This is just outside of the empty tomb. The women have come to see Jesus. They are afraid. They see these uh, angels. They're contending with the fact that the tomb is empty. And then Luke writes, they remembered his words. Then they remembered his words and everything changed. Two disciples are walking along the road and they meet with Jesus, but they don't know that it's him. And in verse 27, Luke writes, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. They remembered his words. Jesus explained the scriptures. And then finally, a meeting of Jesus with his disciples. They're still struggling with what it means for Jesus to be alive. And then in verse 45, Luke writes, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. What I want you to see in this passage today is that God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. If you would say during these weeks that you have battled with anxiety, fear, or other overwhelmingly negative emotions and you'd like to make that same journey that Lorene made the word of God is the critical feature God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities I want you to see three things in these encounters this morning first of all the living word creates new worlds the living word creates new worlds when we meet these women in the very first verses of chapter 24, Luke writes, On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find Jesus. And they were perplexed about this, overwhelmed with fear. You see, when we first meet these women, they're in the fog of earthbound expectation. They're in the fog of earthbound expectation. They go to the tomb on that morning as a part of their duty. As women, as followers of Jesus, he's now dead. 
He's supposed to be in that grave, and they know what they're supposed to do. They are living in the natural world, in old world realities. That is what they are looking for. That's what the angels will ask. What are you looking for? Whom do you seek? What's your mindset? And in these first verses, these women are trapped in this fog of earthbound expectations. And here's the deal. If this world, the natural world, the old world is all the world there is, it's the only thing that there is, then the word of God is dead. The word of God has no effect. The word of God is forgotten. It's irrelevant. Because the word of God, the truth of God, resurrection reality speak of a whole new world, a whole new transformed existence that's characterized not by death, but by life. And when they remember the words of Christ, they remember his promises of life. And the fog of earthbound expectation is dispelled by the light of the living word. He's not here. He's alive. He's risen from the dead and their eyes are opened to the fact that there's a whole new reality, a whole new existence. Death, Paul says, is swallowed up by victory. And this is the power of the word of God. It brings dead things to life. It exposes the emptiness of the old world, exposes the emptiness of our old existence and the word of God brings us to life. One of the verses I want you to pay attention to throughout the rest of this sermon is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And in that verse, it begins by Paul reminding us that all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. In that term that Paul essentially creates, he speaks of something that harkens back to the very first chapters of Genesis when God breathes uh, on on, uh, the first man and he becomes a living being. That's what the word of God does. It brings dead things to life. And that's the story of the scriptures all the way through from Genesis, where God creates the world through his word, all the way to Revelation, where his word and his spirit bring the new creation, bring the new Jerusalem. It's the story of Israel that's picturing Eden brought back to its original intent and in fact brought to completion. And all of that culminates in the mission and the life and the purposes of Christ to bring the promises of new creation, breaking right in to the old realities and the old ways of seeing things. The living word creates new worlds. That's the power of God's word. One of the ministries here at our church that I stay consistently thrilled about is called Gideon's International. You may be familiar with it. If you've ever been in a, in a uh, hotel room, you'll open up the, uh, uh, the drawers there, uh, maybe in the dresser or the bedside table, and you'll find a copy of the Word of God. And it's the Gideons who leave them there, and they live, leave copies of the Word all over the world, millions and millions of copies of God's Word. And the testimonies over the years of how just the word of God transforms lives are unbelievable. One man tells the story of reading his Gideon Bible that he'd been given in prison. He was pulling some of the pages out to roll up cigarettes. And he said, while he was smoking Leviticus, he was reading the gospel of John. He didn't know anything about God's word. He had never had any exposure to the church or the message of the gospel, but just by reading the scriptures, he was completely changed. And now he's a preacher of the gospel. It's another story of a a little boy born into terribly difficult circumstances, surrounded constantly by abuse of every kind. And then he went to school. He was put in the special ed classroom because he stuttered so badly. The abuse just kept him so stunted in every area. And then a faithful teacher gave him a Gideon Bible, a copy of God's word. And she started using that Bible to teach him to read. And he started to learn the promises of God and how God felt about him. And he was transformed, brought from death to life. And now he's a preacher and a bishop and a leader in the church. 
Another story is told of a woman who was in a hotel room when attackers burst through her door to do her harm. And as they uh, wrestled about in the room, the bedside table was turned over and out tumbled one of those Gideon Bibles. The woman managed to, to wedge herself underneath that bedside table and open up God's word to the book of Psalms. And she began to read the word of God to her attackers. And after a half a chapter or so, the men who were intending to do her harm fled the room because the power of the truth of the word of God. That's what the word does. It brings dead things to life. It intervenes to bring whole new kinds of realities and truth. And so again, that's Lorene's story. She was trapped in a world of fear. And then she remembered, I'll go to God's word and it changed everything. Maybe your story this morning is Bible reading for you is kind of non-existent. It's, it's never been something that you've been able to do or comfortable doing or, or disciplined to do. It may be because fundamentally you're kind of fine with the world the way that it is. You've insulated yourself from the brokenness of the world and, and sort of told yourself that things are fine the way they are, even though they are most assuredly not. And very often what the Lord will do is he'll allow a crisis to enter your life, to remind you that this world is not your home. And if you've come to recognize in the midst of this crisis that this can't be all there is, then I would challenge you to go to God's word. It is God breathed and it will bring you to life. It'll bring your marriage to life. It'll bring your family to life. It'll transform your relationships. It'll give you direction and sustenance and it will point you to whole new possibilities that are characterized by the supernatural. The living word creates new worlds. Secondly, we find in Luke 24 that the Lord's word crafts cross-shaped worlds. The Lord's word crafts cross-shaped words. The next interaction in Luke 24 are the two disciples that are walking along the road back to Emmaus. Basically, these disciples of Jesus have been disappointed by his death and they are going home. Emmaus was a hotbed of, of um, nationalism and resistance against the powers of Rome. And so these men were really looking for Jesus, someone who would fulfill their political agenda, someone who would get involved in their game. They were trapped in the fog of egocentric expectations. They were fine with Jesus as long as he fit in with what they were looking for and what they wanted to accomplish. For them, the word made flesh was to be a magic word or a spell that would, would operate according to their wishes and their vision. Look at verses 19 through 21. Jesus meets them and he talks to them, but they don't recognize him as Jesus. And so he says, what things are you men talking about? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word, and in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. What they share with Jesus is we had a particular view of what Jesus was going to do. He was just a prophet. He did all these wonderful things and he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, to kick out all of our problems and to give us what we want. And as long as they looked at Jesus that way in the fog of egocentric expectation, they couldn't see Jesus. Verse 16 says their eyes were prevented from seeing him and they're prevented by these egocentric expectations. And Jesus will say to them later, verse 25, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? In these disciples' minds, 
They couldn't comprehend a crucified Christ. They couldn't comprehend a suffering Messiah. Those things didn't go together. And so they couldn't see Jesus. But then Jesus, verse 27, beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. And so he walked these disciples from Genesis to Revelation, helping them to understand that it was necessary, it was necessary that the Christ should suffer. The Bible teaches that from beginning to end. In Genesis, when the problem of sin enters into the world, there's a promise of one who will come, who will crush the head of the serpent Satan, and at the same time will be stricken in the process of laying his life down. In Exodus, there's a Passover lamb. In Deuteronomy, uh, 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 there in, or in Numbers, uh, there's, the, there's the serpent that's lifted up, bringing salvation to all who will look. In Deuteronomy, there's a prof- promise of a word that comes down, uh, a word that comes comes up from the dead, uh, a word that enters in and transforms and changes. In Joshua, that, uh, uh, that name is Jesus' name, Yeshua, and he is the one uh, who runs to the problem when everyone else is running away like Joshua did. He's the one who says, I don't care what everyone else is doing, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And then through the history of the Old Testament that culminates in David, we find one who is willing to go into the valley and confront the enemy and bring freedom to the people of God and to pursue the nations. And the rest of Israel's history is the story of their failure to be this sacrificial people that God has called them to be. Yet in the prophetic books, the promise of one to come, a suffering servant, one who will receive into himself the wounds that were due everyone else. That's the promise of the prophecy of the Old Testament. And even in the wisdom literature, Jesus is the wisdom of God, not a worldly wisdom, not a man-made wisdom, but a wisdom that comes on high, a wisdom that answers the sovereign command of the Lord with obedience and sacrifice and service. And from beginning to end, there's a promise, a cross-shaped promise of this one who is going to come, who's gonna lay his life down, making the appropriate sacrifice, the one who's willing to suffer. The suffering of the righteous is a message of the scriptures from beginning to end. And what Jesus does is he reminds these men of the truth of the scriptures that they say they believe the Christ must suffer. That's how he saves. Look at verse 31. It says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This was when Jesus broke the bread. I think that's such an incredible picture. As they come to recognize the broken Messiah, the one who willingly allows his body to be crushed, they come to see Jesus for who he really is. And their eyes are opened as they understand the scriptures that say that the Christ must suffer for us. And he calls us into that same kind of life. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that this God-breathed scripture is profitable for teaching, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Here's what God's word does is it conforms us to the image of Christ. It teaches us about who he is. It teaches us and convicts us that our way is wrong and his way is right. It straightens us out. That word for, uh, for correction is, a, uh, is the same word we get orthopedics from. He takes broken things and he sets them straight and conforms them to his shape. And then he trains us in these things so that we can come to live them in our day-to-day existence with commitment and consistency. The story of the scripture is the story of this savior who lays his life down. The story of the scripture is not one who comes along and helps us do all the things that we wanna do but he is this one who comes and redeems us, who reveals to us that what we wanna do on our own always takes us in the wrong direction. And he receives the punishment that we deserve 
And he calls us forward into this whole new way of living, the sacrificial life. This is the story of Christ. And sometimes it's difficult to recognize because it doesn't fit easily into what we want to do. Years ago, my youngest son, Jake, came home from vacation Bible school with one of his crafts. And uh, uh, it was a, a picture that he had drawn, but it was a little bit strange. It was a squirrel with sandals on. And so I asked Jake, uh, what's, a, what's the deal with this drawing from vacation Bible school? And Jake said, well, it's a picture that started out as Jesus, but it wound up being a squirrel. We run into those problems sometimes. It's, it's hard to, to envision Jesus. And, and sometimes we want to start out trying to understand him, but eventually we, we draw him into the shape that we want him to be. And yet the message of scripture is that the crucified Messiah, though he runs against the grain of our expectation and our agenda, the crucified Messiah, he's the center of the whole story. And we know this to be the case. Fundamentally, every story that we tell is some form of a redemption story. When you break every story down to its common denominator, there's a big problem. And then the right sacrifice has to be made. And then redemption comes to all people. That's in all the stories we tell. Either that's done successfully or it's done unsuccessfully. But we have a deep longing for redemption as the result of sacrifice. And that's the message of the Bible. And that's the story that gives shape to our life. A cross-shaped existence changes us redeems us, and then it points us uh, to a future that rests in the full reality of who Jesus is. And so today, your Bible reading may not be what it needs to be. You may need a renewal in your love for the Word of God because you either don't understand or you don't like the plot of Scripture. The point of Scripture is to point you to Jesus the point of Scripture is to make you more like Jesus. Every single book tells that story from beginning to end. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures that all of the prophets were speaking about Him. When Jesus is at the center of who you are, Jesus is at the center of your passion and affections, then you're gonna have an awakening love for the word of God. And you may wanna do like that man did in the Gideon story. Just start with the gospel of John. Get to know Jesus. And then he'll anchor your reading of the rest of scriptures, of the scriptures as God points you to a cross-shaped world. The living word creates new worlds. The Lord's word crafts cross-shaped worlds and the limitless word captures lost worlds. That's the last thing that I want you to see. And the final uh, interaction of Jesus with his disciples, uh, that takes place uh, uh, beginning in verse 36. But I want to point you to, to verse 44 of Luke 24. Jesus is, is speaking to these men and, uh, we're, and go on up to verse 41 because there's a very interesting passage of scripture here. Jesus uh, appears to these disciples. They see him as the resurrected savior. But look at verse 41. Even though they've seen him, they've seen his hands and his feet, his nail pierced hands and feet. Verse 41 says this, while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. They still couldn't believe, really believe in the resurrection power of Christ because of their amazement, because of their joy. This is, a, this is an incredibly challenging verse, but I think the answer is clear enough. They are trapped in the fog of what I'm calling exiguous expectations. You know, I can't get through a sermon without using one of those $60 words just because uh, I'm kind of a nerd. And so uh, I want to give you the word exiguous. I also need it to fit in with the rest of my sermon outline alliteration, but exiguous is a good word. It means trifling or incredibly small. 
insignificant. And here's what's going on in this fog of exiguous expectations. The reaction of the disciples to their master being alive is just relief, they say. We're not gonna die. Our hopes have not been completely crushed. We're gonna be okay. Everything's gonna work out for us now. And in that moment of really thinking kind of small about the significance of the resurrection of the dead, they're still missing the full significance of resurrection power. They've got small expectations. Yes, Jesus is alive. Yes, he's the crucified and resurrected Savior. But that kind of mainly applies to me. And those expectations are dispelled by the light of the limitless word. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and this is crucial, verse 47, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Jesus speaks not only here of his death and resurrection being a fulfillment of the scriptures, but he also speaks of the proclamation of this good news to the whole world as the fulfillment of the scriptures as well. Again, this takes us all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, where Abraham receives a promise that he'll become a great nation and that through him, through his people, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This new world doesn't come. Resur resurrection realities are not fully on display until everyone is heard about this good news of forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and him alone alone. And that story that begins in Genesis of all the nations being in the, in the heart of God, that takes us all the way to the final chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, where the nations are streaming into the new Jerusalem. And it speaks of the Garden of Eden being restored and a great tree being there that has leaves for the healing of the nations. It's not... Uh, it, merely that Jesus saves us, but he saves us for a purpose that pushes us to bring this good news to those who have not heard it yet. Luke will go on uh, to write the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter one, he speaks again of this call to be witnesses of these things. That when we really understand the joy of knowing the Lord, then we share that joy with others. And the book of Acts ends in Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. The, the book of Acts ends after all these things that are being done in the church and for the church and through the church. Luke's story in Luke and Acts of the coming of Christ and the birth of the church, that whole story ends with these words, that the gospel was preached unhindered. The gospel of the kingdom is being preached unhindered. That's the point of the word of God. That's the promise of the word of God. And so 2 Timothy 3, 17 says this, this God-breathed word that cleans us up and straightens us out and gives us a Christ shape, that is all for a purpose that we would be equipped, every believer would be equipped for every good work, that we would have the things we need to do the task that we've been assigned. You can't stay in the tomb. It's what the angels tell these women. Tells the men going uh, back home, you can't go home and just do what you were doing before. Glad that you've met Jesus. And then he tells these disciples at the end, you can't just have joy and relief that 
that good news of salvation has come to you but you really have believed and you've really been transformed and you've really been filled with convictional joy when that is a message that you want to take to the whole world. Several years ago, I found myself in North Mississippi at a breakfast with an Ethiopian from Addis Ababa named Abraham who had come to the United States to work on some different aspects of his education. It was quite an unexpected meeting at that little uh, breakfast restaurant there in North Mississippi. And it's a pretty interesting story of how it came about. How would there be an Ethiopian who's come to North Mississippi to meet with a preacher who was born in Texas? Well, a critical point of that story actually took place in Norway. A man named Hans Nielsen Hauge was an ordinary farmer in the late 1700s, pretty poor, very ordinary guy. And one day when he was out in his fields doing his work, he was completely transformed by a filling of the Spirit that overwhelmed him with a love of God and a passion for those who didn't know the Lord. And so this uneducated man began to preach, began to travel, call people to a fresh, deep relationship with God through the power of his word, that they didn't just need to sit in, uh, in church and let someone else tell them about uh, what God's word was all about, but they needed to read and know God's word for themselves. And if they knew it, they would want to share it. Eventually, followers of how you heard the mission call. They heard the call to take good news to people who hadn't heard it yet. And some of those Scandinavian missionaries made their way all the way to Ethiopia and they preached the gospel and churches were planted. And generations later, an Ethiopian named Abraham heard the gospel in one of those churches, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and entered into a journey that would take him all over the world as he preached the gospel. That's how God's word works. God's word captures a lost world, lost people like me in Texas, lost people like Abraham in Ethiopia, and points all in between and everywhere. To really know God's word is to be set on mission by the word for the world. Again, that's Lorene's testimony. What the Lord has taught her through the crisis of losing her husband, it trained her on how to go to God's word in the midst of fear so that when she walked into this most recent crisis that we're all involved in, she had learned to live in the reality of a cross-shaped life. And it's her belief, even in the midst of this hard thing, that our life should be an invitation to the world around us. They should see us as people not overwhelmed by fear and that what God wants to do during this time is to reawaken and re-enliven the word that we say we believe so that it speaks out of our lives and transforms others around us. Maybe if you don't have a deep passion for the Word of God, maybe if your Bible reading is really pretty paltry, it could be because you're not really interested in the mission. You're not really interested in the mission. Yes, Jesus is alive and yes, He's come and saved you and you've got your spot in heaven secured. But somehow you missed central, the central message, which is that that transforming word to you is to be spoken out of your life, that you become a minister, that this truth that fills you with hope instead of fear can be the truth for someone in your circles of influence, influence that does not know that word quite yet. That's what the Word of God does. It captures lost worlds. Is this God's Word for you and, and, and in you and through you for the world? God's Word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. Is this God's Word 
to you. Would you bow your heads with me? Right where you are in your homes, would you be willing just to bow for a moment and do some business with God's Word? Would you recognize this morning that God has stopped the whole world so He could speak to you, draw you back to His Word? Maybe you've always struggled with a consistent interaction with the Word of Truth. Maybe you just need to pray this prayer. God, breathe your word into me. Bring me life. Maybe your prayer needs to be, God, I've come to recognize I'm spiritually dead and I need the life-giving breath of your word, your gospel for the very first time. Lord, come in and save me, forgive me, fill me, bring me to life. God, let your word be a life-giving word to me. Maybe a commitment you can make this morning is, God, I have not been faithful to be a passionate student of the scriptures because I, I've resisted the fundamental plot line that through it, you're calling me to the cross. You wanna shape my life in the shape of Jesus so that you can use me to bring hope and joy and peace to the world. And so this morning, I say yes to your word. I say yes to your savior. I say yes to your mission because your word is the key that unlocks these resurrection realities for me. If these are your prayers this morning and you'd like to know more about what it means to pursue the Lord Jesus and the power of his word, we would love to share some of that hope and that truth with you. You'll see a number on your screen and you can text your decision or your need to us we want to be the hands and feet of Christ to you because we believe that God's word is truth. So anything that you might need, if you're just struggling, if you don't have this peace, if you don't have this freedom from fear that we've been talking about, we want to talk to you because God has a gift of his presence and his word that he wants to give to you. So if you've got a need that we can help meet, please share that with us. You can do that through text. You can go to our website. We want to talk to you and bring you some encouragement during this season. I pray that the truth and the power of the resurrection of Christ will be yours in an unprecedented way as we walk through this time together. The Lord's blessings on you on this Lord's day.